My name is Gene Farnsworth, and I'm reading a book called All Star, How Larry Doby Smashed the Color Barrier in Baseball. It was written by Audrey Vernack and illustrated by Canada Chapman. The boys in Larry Doby's neighborhood, tall and short, black and white, slow and fast, all played baseball together. Many heard an announcer in their head giving the play-by-play -play of every throw and catch. When young Larry stepped to the plate, he longed to hear, now batting for the Brooklyn Dodgers, Larry Doby. While Larry was growing up in the 1920s and 30s, there were no black players in Major League Baseball, none. The door was closed to black players. It didn't seem like a door to Larry. Doors can open. To him, it looked like a wall. His world didn't even allow him to dream of reaching the major leagues. The world would have to change. When Larry was a boy in Camden, South Carolina, the South was largely segregated, but his neighborhood was not. I went to one school, they went to another, Larry said. And when school was out, we came home. We lived on the same block and we played and we never thought about color. Back then, everyone listened to sports on the radio. Sometimes it felt like the whole country was listening together, especially during boxer Joe Lewis's fights. When he would win, everyone in the neighborhood would come out and have something like a cheerleading rally because we were all so happy about it. At age 14 in 1937, Larry moved to New Jersey, where many schools were still segregated, though not the one he attended. He was an all-state athlete in baseball, football, and basketball at Eastside High School in Patterson, New Jersey, and often the only black player on the team. I couldn't wait for school to get out, to get on the football field or basketball court or baseball field. I just waited for that bell to ring. Looking back, there was a historical moment on that high school football field, a meeting of two men who would someday each be famous for being second. In a big game against Montclair High School, Larry scored the winning touchdown. The Montclair team had a player named Buzz Aldrin, who in 1969, as an astronaut, Buzz would be the second man to walk on the moon. Given the circumstances at that time, Larry said, you could say I had as much chance of getting to play in the major leagues as Aldrin did of going to the moon. The world would have to change. Larry was such a good ball player that while still in high school, he played for the Newark Eagles, a team in the Negro Leagues. The Negro Leagues were baseball leagues specifically for black and other non-white players, providing the only opportunity for them to play professionally. Even so, Larry didn't imagine a future playing baseball. He hoped for a college scholarship and to find a job as a high school coach. That dream came true, sort of. He received a scholarship, but was forced to leave school when he was drafted into the Navy. He was stationed at bases around the country before he was sent to Lulithi, an island in the South Pacific. That's where Larry heard some surprising news. It came on the radio that Mr. Branch Rickey had signed Jackie Robinson to play for the Brooklyn Dodgers organization. Larry knew Jackie from the Negro Leagues. Maybe the world was starting to change. After the war, Larry returned to the Newark Eagles, playing second base. He was starting to think he might have a career in baseball. Larry helped his team win the Negro League World Series in 1946. He was 23 at the time. That year, Jackie Robinson was playing with the minor league Montreal Royals. The next season, 
Jackie made his major league debut with the Brooklyn Dodgers. He was voted Rookie of the Year, but he faced terrible racism. Opposing players and spectators alike screamed insults. There were threats made against him and his family. The world can be a mess when it's changing, but it had started to change. Jackie opened the door and Larry followed closely behind when team owner Bill Veck signed him to the Cleveland Indians. Larry had enormous respect and affection for Vic. I was fortunate enough to have a fine man to work for, probably one of the nicest and greatest men I have ever met, because even at that particular time, he never showed any prejudice or bigotry. Unlike Jackie, Larry didn't play in the minor leagues first. He went straight from the Negro Leagues to the major leagues. I'd like to say that Jackie made it easy for me, Larry said, but I didn't see any difference. 11 weeks did not alter the course of race relations in this country. Larry knew that Jackie Robinson had faced terrible racism and hatefulness from his teammates, opponents, and fans when he joined the Dodgers in the National League. As the first black player in the American League, Larry did not expect things to be much better. He wasn't wrong. His first day with the Indians was one he always remembered, not in a good way. Some teammates refused to shake Larry's hand and two turned their backs on him. When he went on the field to warm up, no one would throw the ball with him. I had never been so alone in my life, he said. I stood there alone in front of the dugout for five minutes. But that was just the beginning. He could not stay at white-only hotels with the team and could not enter some stadiums through the main entrance. He often had to eat alone. He was called horrible, unspeakable names and was spit on by an opposing infielder. Larry thought of racist people as sick. He knew there was nothing he could do to heal them. Baseball Hall of Famer Willie Mays said, Larry put in just as hard a time as Jackie Robinson. Those two go hand in hand. In 1948, Larry moved from the infield to the outfield and started playing even better. He helped the Indians win the World Series, the biggest moment of his career. In game four, Larry made history when he hit the game-winning home run. A photograph was taken of Larry celebrating with winning pitcher Steve Gromek. When the last out had been made and the game was over, he ran up and we embraced each other, Larry said. When you look at the picture, you see the kinds of enormous smiles usually found on boys' faces, not men's. Steve's arms are wrapped around Larry's neck. Gromek's mouth is open in the best kind of huge, gleeful grin. It is a picture of pure joy. When that a picture appeared in the newspapers, it really surprised people. I think it might have been the first time that a picture like that a white man embracing a black man went all over the country. That picture represents one of the finest moments in my life. And it shows exactly how the world was changing. Larry Doby was a true star, named to the All-Star team the next year, and the next, and the next, 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 next. Seven years in a row. The world was changing, but progress was slow. As each player took his turn, he opened doors to those behind him, with more black players joining the major leagues each year. Barriers take time to fall, and this one took a really long time. It wasn't until 1959 that every baseball team was integrated. The Boston Red Sox were the last to sign a black player. But change didn't stop there. Change never stops. 
Yesterday's players opened the door for today's, and today's players are opening doors for those lined up behind them. We honor the people who lived through impossibly hard times by continuing their fight on the field and off. The world doesn't change all by itself. People change the world. People with strength and confidence. It takes a superstar on the field and off. A man like Larry Doby, who achieved way beyond his own boyhood dreams.